Hello and welcome to the next episode of The Prestige, a podcast about films, filmmaking and film theory. In each programme we'll focus on a particular movie, we'll talk about it, review it, discuss some of the ideas and themes it throws up. And as always we'll end with our recommendations for films to watch following this week's film based on it either closely or remarkably tenuously. Before all that, who are we and what do we do? So my name's Rob Maythorn, I am... I spent the last 10 years in the British film industry making films and these days I've retired to sunny Shropshire to write about films, talk about films and occasionally take photos of people. And my colleague is Sam Knowles. He is a writer and lecturer, very well educated, read a lot of books, written some books uh, around culture and literature and all the spaces in between. And also on a completely unrelated note, uh, a book review I wrote has just come out this evening and it's about cricket so not anything to do with anything we'll be talking about in this podcast if you like cricket go and read it Any, anyway fair enough we'll throw a link in the yes we'll, we'll, we'll throw a link in the show notes yes um it, so this week rob your turn it was my turn and i picked the 2010 film by david robert mitchell the myth of the american sleepover I just feel like I should have done more this summer. You did a lot. I mean, fun stuff. Like, I don't know. You ever think about a person so much that you start to believe that they might know that you're thinking about them? When I was a kid, maybe. So this film essentially tells the story of a group of kids in suburban Michigan on one night uh, in which a bunch of sleepovers are happening and the adventures that they go on. It's by David Robert Mitchell, who some of you may know as director of It Follows, the horror film that came out last year, and I'm sure I've mentioned in my past as my uh, as some of my recommendations on other other weeks of horror. It's slow, it is thoughtful, it is in many ways more of a mood piece than a feature film, and just charts the stories of probably four main four main teenagers, but essentially a whole group of teenagers and their interactions over an evening. If anyone's interested in seeing this, I will warn you, this isn't American Pie, this isn't super bad. This is much closer to something like Tree of Life, much closer to something like Jerry, that kind of slow, thoughtful film. Sam, what do you think? Um, I went through phases in this film. Um, the first note I have is fragmented beginning, I think I like it. Um, I then went through a phase where I really didn't like it at all. I didn't like what it was doing and wanted it to be something different. And then like, towards the end, I started warming to it again. I ended up really liking the end. Okay. So, um, yeah, they went went through phases. Um, I think partly related to the general acting ability of whichever teenager happened to be focused on. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought Rob, for example, was not very good until the end I quite liked the ending of his story um, yep. but I didn't like the middle part of his story I didn't like the, the way that was acted but I suppose that's a risk you take with largely untried actors um, and I know that some of these it, this is their first acting credit and they've gone to star in it, it Follows but they haven't done much else um, yeah it he, he went through went through phases of me I think the the bit with Scott was much better, but then that may be maybe an acting ability thing again. Um, I didn't like Claudia's section, but maybe that's that's something that we were supposed to think. Um, and I liked Maggie a lot more. Um, but yes, up up and down. I think 
over, overall I did like it, but with with some reservations um, to do with the pacing and the acting. Fair enough. Fair How enough. about you? I well, I really liked it. Um, I I would concur with your points in that when you are dealing with teenage actors and untested actors you do kind of roll the dice a little bit on how well you can carry certain things mm. as, as Sam mentioned there's kind of probably four main stories running through it Maggie, Rob, Claudia and Scott and you're right Claudia's is one where I really wasn't sure how to feel about it um, she essentially is a, a newer import to the area who finds out that her boyfriend previously had a thing with a girl and so in retaliation she seems to have a thing with that girl's boyfriend and it was one it was clear it was like you weren't really sure whose side you want and even rob's character who basically early on seeing film sees a girl in the grocery store he really likes and decides to hunt her down there's at times you kind of are on his side claire is probably the most sort of unapologetically happy story that you feel you can be on you her mean- um, Maggie, sorry. Ma- Maggie played by Claire, yeah, yeah. Claire Slamer, who was, I thought was brilliant, but hers is yes, un- unapologetically yes. lovely and, you know, heartfelt and sweet. Scott's, I, I, Scott's, I, I'm, I'm torn on because I like you. I went through periods of it where, when it first sort of developed what that storyline was going to be, uh, it's when he, he he's a college dropout and he comes back to town, discovering that one of this set of twins had a thing for him. So he goes to find the twins and kind of discover which of them liked him I was really worried that was going to be the the storyline that dissolved into shall we say American high school films into American Pie mm. into Super Bad into that kind of thing I was really kind of worried that it was, it was going to be a a lovely looking version of that same story but it it cleverly was more than that but I did on that one I kind of was unsure because it, it felt to me it strayed too close towards that kind of sexploitation film and the sex comedies mm. of, of, of the mid-90s. I think that the film is... I really like the fact that the film, it kind of... You feel that they're teenagers, which obviously they're acting, but if you look at a lot of teenage films, it's very clear that the actors are in their 20s, if not older. Infamously, yeah. so, so, some high school films, the teenagers are played by people in their 30s. With this, you very much do feel that. Freddie they're... Prince Jr. Huh? Sorry. Yes. Don't <laughs> bring up your favourite film, but Freddie Prince Jr. Yes. It, it, this. In this, you very much do feel that they are this age, and with that comes their awkwardness and their kind of thing. But it actually feels much more real in that respect. And I'm sure we'll touch on this a little bit later um, as we deal into the ideas of adolescence. But that especially with the slightly grandiose title of The Myth of the American Sleepover. To me, that's what he was trying to say, is that he isn't saying that sleepovers are a myth, but somehow the, the film, the cinematic idea of a sleepover is a myth. And mm. the idea, whilst kind of blown and torn, the idea that everything seen before has been a myth, but maybe this, this is the real version of what it's like to be a teenager. Yeah. But it, I, I liked as well, there wasn't sort of a, a straightforward criticism. It, it, this wasn't saying it, the films like American Pie are a myth. Mm. This wasn't sort of. It, it could have been fairly sort of bitingly ironic about a whole genre of films here, but it wasn't. It was also saying something about this idea of becoming becoming an adult maybe mm. moving into adolescence something about being a teenager there was something mythological about that and particularly between Maggie and the boy whose name I never know who was who were had a, had a conversation in the in the middle of a pool yep yep um, anyway. yeah and they they have this this conversation about the idea of a sleepover and and it, it being something that actually you kind of look back on nostalgically when you're 16 and isn't it ridiculous to be nostalgic when you are 16 and they say that but also actually there's something about being a kid and then not being a kid there so I, I like the way the film it, it wasn't sort of savagely critical of 
high school films in general, it no. was saying something interesting about the mythology of adolescence as well. And I think I think that that's uh, I, I, about what I was saying earlier. I do think the film it isn't savagely, but even things like American Pie, it isn't which it feels like a reaction to. It isn't critical in a savage kind of way. It isn't a lampooning or a spoof or a or a takedown. It's just kind of mm. a, a gentle, different opinion, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but is it, I think that that, that uh, conversation that Sam's talking about for me felt like the crux of the film. And mm. we'll move into this talking about adolescence now a little bit, is that the idea that the myth of adolescence and this kind of... And I think that this myth of adolescence works both ways. That and Sam and I are both in our 30s, and we met when we were probably 12. Did you tell from your Well, I, yeah, I was a bit younger. You were a bit younger, yeah. yeah. About, that. about that age. Um, and so our teenage years were the, the formative years of our friendship. And then there is, as an adult, this kind of, I don't know, the mythologizing of teenage years. The idea that teenage years were these formative, these salad days, these golden days of our childhood. And mm. when you're younger than that, the teenage years are what you're looking forward to. The, 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 these years are in our society presented as this kind of free and wonderful time. And so many films buy into the idea that being a teenager is, you know, that's the time for adventures and falling in love and having all these kind of things. And the, I suppose the idea is that maybe, maybe that isn't true, that the myth of that, the, the adolescence in this special time is the myth in the real world as well as cinematically. Hmm. I think actually I can sort of sum this up a bit by my response to one particular film. And it's not, it, it may be a film that surprises you. Because I saw, I must have seen this film more than twice, but I remember watching this film twice. Once when I was probably 12 or 13, and once when I was in my 20s. Um, and the two times I watched it, the song. 16 going on 17 meant something very different mm. like being watching the sound of music at the age of 12 is a completely different experience from being the other side of of being a teenager yes um and i i remember thinking i remember think, feeling feeling a bit a bit nostalgic in my 20s and also thinking isn't it strange how much like, like you were just saying, how much I look forward to being sixteen, going on seventeen, when I was twelve. How how much that seemed seemed to be the only the only age to be. So that film becomes a very different film watched from either either end of being a teenager. Mm. Um, the experience of moving towards being sixteen and then looking back semi nostalgically on being sixteen is something very different. I think that's maybe indicative of adolescence as a whole, that we're often pulled in one direction or another. And mm. and teen adolescent films very much, I suppose, are kind of closely linked with the genre of coming-of-age films. The idea that this is the period when you transition from one thing to another. Yeah, And yeah. I suppose the, maybe the, the, here you're talking about maybe that that actually that transition is that you're losing something the idea of going from childhood to adulthood especially that that main speech in the pool where he's like actually that's a lie like why why are we running from that why are we especially teenage years are one of those kind of sort of easy to be rushing to grow up they always say like until you're about 25 you're always rushing to get older and then at 25 you're trying to get younger again and yeah. I think the teenage years especially are, are marked by this desire to grow up and that's why so th th these genres are so closely linked the idea of having sex for the first time, falling in love for the first time, going across country, that the that those coming of age films are all about adolescence. And this film isn't. It isn't about coming of age. And no one no one here is really having their first kiss. No one here is having their first experience. It's just a case of a snapshot of what it's like to be a teenager. And I think the film is notable and I'd say in its kind of timelessness. Mm. Um, yeah. there are no phones there is no internet but it doesn't feel dated you know the car, there are cars around it's kind of nondescript you feel it could be now you know you've got people with lip piercings it could be 10 years ago and it kind of puts itself in this strange kind of timeless period and I think that helps mm. that kind of feel yes yeah I, I was thinking about it as I was watching it and, and thought this this felt like 
and in, you, you you were saying how it wasn't sort of savagely critical of films like American Pie, and I agree with you, but it felt like the only way in which it was critical of films like that was in the fact that it was maybe set at the same time. Mm. And this was a film set in the late 90s, early noughties that was saying, this is what life is really like. And that may be what David Rob Mitchell was doing, was saying, okay, this is an alternative picture of the end of the 90s. But my, my, my comeback to that would be, is, are you and I reading it that because that was our teenage years? Are we seeing this through the, th- through the filter of our own experiences that we're thinking, well, to us, teenage years is the late 90s. So yeah. we're seeing that in this period. I suppose so, but I was I was thinking more of the the sort of the the absence of phones, as you were saying, and the fact that if if you wanted to meet someone, you'd have to arrange time and a place, mm. and it 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 feels like a, a feels like I suppose a more analog time, um, and actually particularly with um, Rob's keychain as an example that. It's importantly visual, but there's no no sense in which he's got a he's got a picture on his phone. No, he's he's got this this viewer that he shows people. And I, I think that's right. But also, just we're talking about uh, like uh, Maggie, the character, with her like her lip piercing very much felt like a much more two thousand modern period thing. Like I, mm. I I can't remember anyone at our age who was at school who could get away with a lip piercing, a facial piercing at that age. And, like, have you, seen, have you seen It Follows, Sam? No, I haven't. It Follows does a similar thing where there's one character with a smartphone, but that's kind of it. And other characters kind of pick with parts of history. Some One feels very 80s, one feels very 90s. And I think this film kind of drops in the odd hint here and there of different time periods, which builds it towards mm. a more kind of timeless feel. In the same way that and that makes it, as I said, more linked to the idea of, of myth in the mytholo- mythological teenage adolescent era. Because this mm. film is adrift from a particular time period, it can exist in in myth rather than actuality. It's a good point, actually, because that the, the parade sequence at the end, and there's no spoiler in this, it tells you all the way through they're building to a parade the next day, but that parade sequence could be from the 1950s or 60s in the mm. way that primary colours are used in that and the way that the whole t- town comes out to watch it. They feel something quite dated about that. Yes. But like you say, it, does, it doesn't date the film. It helps to undate the film. Mm. helps to make it mythological. I think that there's... It, 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 I think it's very successful in that kind of feel. In the same, like, there are other films that will come to later when we talk about our recommendations that are clear, or at least in my, my recommendations, are clearly from a certain era. And they have a timeless appeal, but they don't feel mm. timeless in the way this one does. Um, and the film feels gentle, I suppose, in many ways. That, uh, you know, I, I, we've all been teenagers, and I can't say that my teenage years live up to. American Pie, or they live up to Ferris Bueller's Day Off, or they live up to Almost Famous, or Ridge Fast Times Rich and High, those aren't my high school experiences, they aren't going to wild kegger parties they aren't, you know, having sex capades with, with cheerleaders but they are hanging out with my friends and watching movies and they are mm. you know, going, not egging a house, but going and doing that kind of, like, this felt much more like a tr- my, my teenage experience um, and yeah. a, more, a more true experience in that respect, despite being yeah. myth. Um, but I wonder how much of that was because of its, um, for want of want of a better word, its applicability to anybody. So because some of the experiences in this are a bit more vague of like kissing a girl or finding someone you like or being silly at a party, not, there aren't any giant set pieces here that that kind of... I don't know, facsimile nature of the events means you can just go and plant it onto yourself and your experiences. Hmm, yes. Yeah. And one of those, actually, a bit of uh, uh, nostalgia from us here, but Rob and I marked the end of, uh, end of our GCSE exams by getting together with friends and just sitting and watching films. And 
I think aiming for twenty four hours straight of films, and we didn't. We we might have, might have just about made it. I, I, I must confess, I did fall asleep at one point, and I've never seen the last forty minutes of Lost in Space. Uh, I don't but think I, any of us. <laughs> <laughs> but that that was about five a.m. and I, and I don't regret that for a second. No, no, that that I can safely say is a film that we will never cover on this podcast. <laughs> it's a, a low point in cinema. <laughs> It was, it was bad. Um, I want to say, actually, before we before we finish with this, I just want to talk about how beautiful this film was to look at. Mm. Um, and I suppose this, this goes on to this idea that you were saying about it being gentle. And yes, the narrative was gentle, but the way that it was shot was gentle as well. And it, it, it felt a very human way it was shot. Um, I have a couple of notes about the camera following the way people's eyes moved in a conversation, and there's there's one sequence with with Claudia and a shooting star when you just see a shooting star go past her face, and you think mm. that's a that's exactly the way Andy would have seen her face in profile, yeah. and also that that's a really beautiful beautiful shot. I, I think just to talk to you for a minute, it was all shot on a red camera, which is a, a very light held camera. And was the first kind of camera to do cinema quality in a small package, and I think that shows that they can. It doesn't feel like there's a huge production. It isn't like they, you know they turn the camera around and see two hundred staff with lights and trucks and everything. It feels small and handheld and personal. And I think that the, mm. cho- the choice of camera, whilst I can't actually speak to the production, f- it feels like that was part of that process. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. So, Sam, recommendations. Yes. Um, well, I've gone first a couple of times recently. You should go first with your recommendations. Okay, it's your choice. So my two recommendations are both. I ha- I, I've stuck with the theme this week for my recommendations rather than for any kind of uh, people involved. So my first is the 1993 film Dazed and Confused by uh, Richard Linklater, who went on to do many other films that we've all have heard of. Uh, this film is an ensemble piece set in the last day of school 1976 um, and it's stars, the, the cast is mildly insane, Jason London, Jeremy Adams, Mila Djokovic Rory Cotrain, Adam Goldberg it's got Ben Affleck in it it's got um, Cole Hauser in it, it's got loads of people who you'd recognise in it and it's all about this last day, teenagers the freshmen, the seniors the hazing and sort of not coming of age it's coming of age in the same way this is coming of age in that it's a gentle slow you know having a beer with some people some friends that kind of stuff rather than mm. you know going out and having a wild escapade i think it's a film that once again lives in myth rather than actuality but it's well worth uh, a watch if you're as well for anyone basically my second choice is probably a very obvious choice and I don't think this film needs any kind of recognition from me to get seen but it is the 1985 The Breakfast Club. No film more than this probably influenced my early teenage years watching. I saw this when I was probably 12, 13 and it's one that stuck with me. I've probably seen it coming on 10, 15 times now. It's brilliant in handling kind of the disaffection of teenage years the idea that we're all more than the the faces we put up and all more than what everyone else sees us as. It can be a little bit hokey in its kind of rabble-rousing kind of emotion these days, but it's well done by the five main leads and I just think it's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant film. Great. Well, I I thought for one, one awful minute you were going to... Uh page one of mine but actually it turns out that we have we've gone pleasingly in sync with one of our recommendations um the first recommendation is and i'm taking both of them thematically in the way that you are um i suppose the, the first one more thematically than the second one um thinking about the idea of stories that um, take place over a night and are particularly gentle um, have a lot of talking in them, and it's another Richard Linklater film. It's the first of the Before films, 1995 Before Sunrise, mm-hmm. um, and 
there's some great acting in it and there's a great script and Linklater doesn't force things. Um, I think this is, well, it's true with Days and Confused, but it's, it's true with his, his later films as well, that he just lets things play out. And yeah. that's something I really like about Linklater. Um, my second one is uh, a few years later, 2004, The Garden State. Um, Zach Braff film, um, which I'm never sure if I like, but I think <laughs> so. I'm not sure whether to recommend it or not. Um, but I think it, yeah, there are interesting sort of relationships between characters, um, mm-hmm. and I think Zach Braff's a better director than an actor. Um, so, although I'm not sure about the film, I will give that a cautious recommendation. I would say I, I, I'm the same on that film. Is that I like the idea of the film, and I have my memories of watching it enjoyable. If I go back and watch it, I don't tend to make it through the entire film. No, but no. I do like what I watch of it. I would like to mm. throw in a quick honourable mention and a plea to the audience at this point here. Mm-hmm. Honourable mention is just a film that didn't fit thematically with this film for me. But it's a film called Late Last Night. And this is a film that probably no one's ever seen. And I'm sure... Well, <laughs> some people have seen it, I'm sure. Um, but uh, it's one of the ones that was came out in the, um, sort of the 80s. I'm, I'm literally Googling it now as I talk. Um, but it stars... I think it's Emilio Estevez. And it's about two guys ha- all, all night... Um, going out basically um, it's only on VHS and I've got it somewhere uh, but if you can find it online late last night it's well worth a watch and my plea because my film knowledge has failed me okay uh, this doesn't happen to me a lot but I have memories of seeing a film it takes place in Texas it's about adolescence growing up and there's a giant water pipe that runs through the town and at the end I'm sure the water pipe bursts for the life of me, I cannot think of what this film was called or who was in it or anything. All I remember is that this water pipe that at the end bursts. So if any of our listeners, any of the prestigious listeners, know what that film is, please tweet us. Please tweet me. You have made my day. This has been bugging me for about two days what this film is now. Google has failed me. I just don't know. You're getting, getting soft in your old age. Yeah, I, literally. I'm, I'm, my next option is to go into the attic. And uh, and raid through all my old VHS and see if I can find it. I've got, had it on VHS somewhere, but uh, yeah, there we go. Next week, my choice. Yes, moving into December, into the Christmas season. Although the it's strictly the Advent season, I suppose it's not Christmas yet. Um, and I would, I I was very tempted to go with my my favourite Christmas film of all time. But um, I don't think we should watch two Die Hard films in, in one year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go with Home Alone. Okay, good call. So uh, we we it, it, it's an I mean every everyone will have seen Home Alone. It's a film I've watched several times before, but I would like to go back to it from the perspective of this podcast and have another look at it. So Macaulay Culkin, Home Alone, 1990 brilliant if you want to find us online guys you can come and find us at prestige podcast you can find me at life underscore academic or you can find me at rob kaiju and we'll see you guys for home alone is a Kaiju Industries production. Check out their other work at facebook.com forward slash Kaiju Industries. Rawr! Arg.